I'm Cortland Sykes, MAGA candidate for U.S. Senate here in Missouri. And I'm here today to endorse and offer my unequivocal support of Judge Roy Moore of Alabama, a great American and a conservative legend and a Republican United States Senate candidate who will win the special election against the Democrat on December 12th. Judge Moore, this very week, was viciously attacked by a contrived fake news story invented by the Washington Post, a paper controlled by America's leading slickster and giant Ponzi scheme operator, Amazon's Jeff Bezos. The Washington Post is a paper widely known to be fake media's worst offender, an infamous yellow press relic that is irresponsible and out of control, a fanatical left-wing mouthpiece, and a proven and notorious all-liberal, low-credibility liar that will print or do anything to propagandize against conservatives to defeat the conservative right. And that's exactly what they're doing to Judge Roy Moore, printing anything to try to defeat him. We can't let the Washington Post, the Democrats, and rhino establishment Republicans defeat Roy Moore or conservatism. We can't let fake media run our political system or manipulate us with lies. We here in Missouri and those in Alabama, like conservatives throughout America, stand by good men. Roy Moore has been wrongfully and viciously accused by the Washington Post, and so we stand by our man Roy Moore. As a Senate candidate for Missouri, I endorse him enthusiastically. We cannot let fake news control our minds, our politics, or our country. Or let the Washington Post or big media control anything ever again. President Trump and new media, especially Breitbart, and America's finest strategist Steve Bannon, are leading the way. It is our patriotic duty to wipe out fake news media however and wherever we can. It isn't a free press anymore. It's a truth-free press with the Washington Post. They should adopt a new motto. Democracy dies in the darkness of lies told by the Washington Post. I am proud to know and to support and endorse Judge Moore, a West Point graduate, Vietnam veteran, devoted husband of 33 years, outstanding father for grandfather of five, Roy has been twice candidate for governor of Alabama and twice elected chief justice of the Alabama Supreme Court. Twice he stood up for principles against radical liberalism and twice has suffered. Roy Moore heads the foundation for moral law in Montgomery with his wife of 33 years, Kayla. I know personally he is a great man with a wonderful family who has worked hard for decades to earn his deserved great reputation. He has my utmost respect. Judge Moore is a conservative icon, a legend who will help make America great again. In three weeks, Roy Moore will win this special election and go to Washington as the next U.S. Senator from Alabama. And the liberal left are terrified. They're furious to think that Roy Moore will bring with him conservative and traditional values back to the U.S. Senate and join President Trump in abolishing political correctness, special interest, and the anti-traditional values promoted by the Democrats and Rhino Republicans. The left is doing everything possible to try to stop him. The fake media hate Roy Moore just as much as they hate President Trump. Roy means another step towards the end of liberalism. To America's seedy and sleazy liberal and anti-family pop culture, Judge Moore in the U.S. Senate is their worst nightmare. This is why last week, the Washington Post deployed against Roy Moore its favorite and most despicable and desperate fake news scandalizer, the forgotten floozy story strategy in which made-up tales the Washington Post invents about some supposed victimized woman from long ago whose supposed high scruples were supposedly overwhelmed by the vile wiles of some conservative man that the Washington Post has marked for defeat. It's quite an act. In this Washington Post trademark tradition of lying in print, forgotten floozy stories seem to somehow pop up about a month before crucial conservative votes and elections. The Post has done fake news forgotten floozy hit stories attacking many conservatives including Clarence Thomas, Herman Cain, Ted Cruz, 
Donald Trump, and now Judge Roy Moore. The forgotten floozy story is easy to write when cash for trash is on the table. All the Washington Post needs is a sleazy woman who will say or do anything. Police estimate that 1.3 million actual prostitutes work in America, not counting any who may be reporters at the Washington Post. These women have proved by their career choices that they are ready to do or say anything at all for money, especially Washington Post money, which comes with the extra enticement of fame. It was about a swell story we gave you. However wretchedly attained. Apparently, cheap newspaper fame is better than no fame at all to the desperate and the damned. The Washington Post reader gets lots of cues from the Washington Post that its fiction disguised as journalism is so reliable that America no longer needs courts, evidence, rules of procedure, witnesses, experts, or proof anymore. We just need to believe the newspaper's fictional stories in which they want the accused to be guilty until he proves himself innocent. A yellow journalism standard found in the racks and screws of medieval sellers of the 15th century inquisition. Guilty until proven innocent is a standard unknown to modern law and justice. The Post has sucked into its guilty until proven innocent line the likes of Republican rhinos Mitch McConnell, John McCain, Pat Toomey, Lisa Murkowski, all of whom think no presumption of innocence should be necessary to convict Moore. No evidence or trial are necessary. They say Moore should resign based on the Washington Post fictional account alone. It is frightening to realize that people who think like that are making laws in America. And of course, since there is no reliable evidence of events 40 years ago and of events that never happened at all, no one can ever prove what never happened or prove his innocence. If the question were put into a court of law, a motion to dismiss for want of evidence would be made and immediately granted, along with a motion to dismiss for limitations. The law does not allow anyone to raise 40-year-old claims, and no evidence in a court is absolutely fatal to any case. It is a fundamental injustice to charge or to accuse anyone with anything without evidence that is legally sufficient or to charge anyone so long after any supposed occurrence when no reliable evidence could be found even if the alleged deed had ever occurred. But in the Washington Post's yellow journalism world of fake news, there is no standard and there is no justice. Only unfairness and injustice and the ever scribbling pins of malice. Because that's exactly how yellow journalism, newspaper fiction, and fake news work. And since these stories are made up, there are no documents, police reports, hospital records or doctor's reports, no witnesses, no letters, no photographs, no DNA, no fingerprints, no phone records, and no evidence. None. Not a scintilla of real evidence. Nothing at all until sometimes 40 years later, a can of money gets dragged through an Alabama trailer park by the Washington Post, calling all liars to bring their sad invented stories to the paper's money window and cash in for money and fame. It's called cash for trash, and when one trash seller gets paid or famed, the payment is reported over and over until liars are coaxed to step forward with their own made-up tales to sell. Then the liar's pile-on really starts, and it might seem to any clueless reader that a large number of reports have to prove that something must be wrong. Besides, of course, the greed and ruthlessness of the story's concocters. We can't let fake news bring down our conservative icons or movement. What fake news wants is to once again control our political system as it did before Donald J. Trump called out the game of fake news and put a credibility stop on fake media, setting it in its rightful place in everyone's mind. But now we have another job, to finish off fake news and fake media forever. The preposterous story concocted by the Washington Post about Judge Roy Moore isn't very original. It's a tale constructed on the old Little Red Riding Hood fable. 
The Washington Post version of Red Riding Hood is a preposterous passion play about a teenage girl transformed by nearly 60 years of hard living into a nasty crone, now working as a payday loan shark in Alabama. She suddenly wakens, as in a fairy tale, and remembers, she says, that Judge Roy Moore, almost 40 years ago when he was a 32-year-old bachelor, invited her, then a 14-year-old sin-seeking ingenue, into his house in the woods, where she remembers that he touched her on the, quote, outer underwear. Nothing more sordid happens in this idiotic and invented floozy tale. Even the tall tale teller doesn't suggest anything further in her fantasy ever occurred. And had such a tale ever happened in the real world, and it certainly did not because Judge Moore categorically denies ever knowing, seeing, meeting, or hearing of this person, Lee Korfman, it would be impossible to prove innocence. Our Little Red Riding Hood admits her own nasty and tawdry past begins at 16 and she admits that she cannot deny that everyone knows about her. The stories involve alcohol, boys, smoking, drugs, three divorces, attempted suicide, a financial train wreck, and a history of accusing several pastors of sexually molesting her. An impressive witness for sure. But Korfman is probably looking forward to brighter days and to cashing the rubbish into a brighter future at least briefly, doing all the liberal talk shows, magazines, news and speech circuits, while posing as a 60-year-old teenage coquette suddenly destroyed by an imaginary underwear touch of a big bad wolf long ago. No, it certainly isn't much of a story and its credibility is zero, but since Moore is famous and big newspaper money's on the table here, along with an important election, the tall tale teller suddenly has her own lawyer probably to help her remember more clearly, and to sort through the glamour and the publishing contracts that her nasty tale invention promises. The wolf in Red Riding Hood's woods is, of course, Roy Moore, a distinguished West Point graduate, a Vietnam veteran who is a conservative icon with a sound 33-year marriage, four children, five grandchildren, and decades of solid achievement a litany of good works and an unblemished reputation for moral principle that have earned him thousands of friends and loyal followers in Alabama and America. Since any sensible person would believe Judge Moore when he says he's never met his accuser Korfman, that he doesn't know her, and that he's never had contact with her, not ever, Korfman then goes and makes up the world's weakest corroboration story to bolster her lies. Okay, so here we go. She thinks she told one of her girlfriends about 40 years ago, when she was probably somewhere around 14, that she was seeing an older man, her nameless good friend who probably couldn't even remember who the vice president is right now, somehow manages to remember 38 years later Korfman's little tale and the man's name. Surprise, Roy Moore. How convenient and how likely profitable for Korfman and her girlfriend. Some corroboration, some story, some persecution, some system of justice that fake news offers America. The Washington Post and its anti-conservative activists, posing as reporters and scheming at their fiction factory, no doubt realizes that fiction needs detail to make it sound plausible, and so they made sure to add small bits of necessary creative detail into their stories. Every fiction writer knows to do that. Then, to make the whole morass sound more plausible, the writers devise a conflation strategy where they mix several stories by locating three more girls who were somehow and magically found even though they didn't even know each other and have never been found during the previous almost 40 years. Two were coaxed by the Washington Post to say something, but not one would say that Moore touched her or did anything forcible or intimate or inappropriate at all. 
only that they met him or spoke to him, he himself, as a young man, about 32, and during their own teen years, after they were age 16, which, for the record, is the legal age of consent in Alabama. Not one accused Moore of the slightest sexual impropriety or any wrongdoing, but here's the truth. Moore does not know and has never met either of those two girls. The third story bolster girl of the three Washington Post extras is the only one Moore ever knew or met, and she had been 18 when Moore dated her. Again, when Moore was young himself, he was only 14 years older than she was and a bachelor. This young lady, the only one of the four Moore ever met, was not a child as she was spun to appear in the Washington Post, but a young adult of 18, old enough to vote, enlist, marry, go to college, own her own house, and make her own decisions to date or not to date more or anyone else. This is the age gap the Washington Post tries to scandalize by making a young adult woman sound like a child by calling her a teenager or mixing her story up with the story of the other tale-telling Korfman. Nothing about age gaps are unusual, scandalous, illegal, or wrong in Alabama, in America, or in the world. After all, Mitch McConnell, the Republican leader of the anti moore Jackal Pack, got paid $25 million to marry a Taiwanese girl nearly 13 years his junior. So much for rhino establishment virtue. In America, everyone gets to make personal decisions that are no one else's business. And the young lady at age 18 did that. She, as the only one Moore ever knew dated Moore, acknowledges that he took her out only after getting her mother's permission, something he didn't even have to do. And the 18-year-old girl in question went out with Moore for several months. Each time, as an act of her own free will, she volunteered that Moore did nothing wrong, ever. And her mother even told her she was the luckiest girl in the world if Moore was interested in her. The Washington Post was able to find this girl, now in her 50s, because she went on to become Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden's sign language translator. And after she was named as Girl 4 in the Washington Post floozy attack on Moore, she was caught by Breitbart deleting her Facebook pages of the many nasty things that she had said about President Trump, conservatives, and Roy Moore as a Senate candidate. But it was too late. Breitbart caught her and copied all the pre-scrubbed pages, including her fierce support of left-wing causes. She had something to hide, but didn't manage to delete it in time. So here we catch the Washington Post and its liberal helpers in full-on fraud mode, trying to do tricky conflation, trying to mix several stories to make one seem like the other. The uglier story contrivance, the he touched my outer underwear when I was 14 invention, is mixed with the other three perfectly legal, I only dated him when I was of legal age stories that asserted nothing more than gaps in age between dating persons of legal age, not legal violations, moral breaches, or anything else. And when Judge Moore clearly states that he does not know or never met three of the four girls that the Post hoaxed up and blended into one single story, trying to make them all sound like one thing, then the old story conflation trick can be seen for what it is, a fraud and a fake news sham technique that make the Washington Post the master fake news fraudster it is. Judge Moore has been a public figure in Alabama for about 40 years, and in the course of things has been investigated, scrutinized, journalized, opposition researched again and again. And not once did any of these stories come out. Then suddenly, from hundreds of miles away, the Washington Post appears in Alabama and instantly comes up with not one or two, but four accusers, three weeks before the critical election. And to make it look busy and accurate, the Post say that they interviewed 30 people who were probably asked something like how they liked the weather, because none of them had anything revelatory to say about more. Now the glued together, made up floozy attack story is falling apart. The main Washington Post reporter turns out to be a hot check writer. Korfman's own mother says Korfman had no phone in her room and she could not have talked to Moore several times as Korfman had alleged. 
in the county where one woman claims she was served from a bottle of wine one year before she was legal to drink, it turns out was a dry county, and the pizzeria where she supposedly drank it never served wine. So this week, the slimy Washington Post finds itself in emergency panic mode. Disgraced by its false and disintegrating story, and desperate to help Mitch McConnell steal from the people of Alabama their Senate vote and Democratic choice for senator, the Post is in do-anything mode. A robocall identifying itself as the Washington Post has been calling thousands of Alabamans, including drug addicts, parolees, and criminals, offering a $7,000 cash reward for anyone who will come forward with a destructive story about more. And guess what? Suddenly, a 51-year-old Alabama woman wearing a giant faux pearl necklace and standing beside Gloria Allred, the notorious grandstanding publicity-seeking, all-liberal Hollywood attorney who has never been licensed to practice law in Alabama, but who seems to appear wherever flashbulbs and liberals are popping up, holds up two of the most pathetic exhibits of this whole Roy Moore and Washington Post frame-up fiasco. A glamour artist sketch supposedly of this aging woman 40 years ago when she was 16 and an obviously forged high school yearbook dated 1977 where Roy Moore has supposedly wished the woman a Merry Christmas and has supposedly said to a sweeter and more beautiful girl I could not say Merry Christmas and supposedly signed it Love Roy. The last name Moore after the Roy appears to have been added later. The yearbook inscription is so clumsily forged that Dick Tracy can stay home. You won't need him to help you find the fraud here. It looks like Beaver Cleaver and Larry just changed Beaver's report card from grade F to A. Here it is. You can see that the doctored or made up yearbook inscription was written in two colors of ink and three different types of handwriting. Anyone can see that the forger was careless and didn't match the sevens in the date. It looks as if somebody took an old autograph from a public figure or forged someone's autograph then wrote their own self-serving inscription above. A leading forensic expert calls the yearbook forgery a Looney Tune rank amateur job so bad that it can be detected from 200 feet away. Take a look at the forged yearbook again, this time with forensic annotation. You be the judge. You can plainly see the two colored double ink pen job here. One blue, one black. And you can see the marked difference in handwriting. Now compare Roy's genuine signature from a genuine document with the forgery. You can see that a second writer with a different slant has added to the inscription. But then the real problems for the forgers start. Roy Moore was never the DA. He was the assistant DA. Yearbooks in December? When was yours printed? Mine came out in May. Did you ever block print a restaurant's name after your signature? Neither have I. Breitbart News Today reports that three more people have come forward not to accuse Moore, but to vindicate him. Rhonda Ledbetter, who worked for three years at the old Hickory House, where the supposed assault had occurred, said, I was a waitress at old Hickory House for almost three years, from 1977 to 1979, and I never saw Roy Moore come into the restaurant. Not one time. And I would have noticed because most of our customers weren't dressed in suits, especially at night. Beverly Young, Roy Moore's yearbook accuser, claims that she worked there at age 15. But the minimum working age there was 16. Another waitress at Old Hickory during the time, Renee Chevera, said I was a waitress at Old Hickory House in the summer of 1977, before my senior year of high school. When I heard Beverly Nelson's story, the first thing that stuck out to me was that I don't remember seeing Roy Moore ever come into the restaurant. I also don't remember Beverly Nelson working there. Lastly, a former Gadsden police officer and Etowah County Sheriff deputy, an over 20 year veteran, has come forward to say, I was a regular customer at Old Hickory House. I never once saw Judge Moore come in there. If he had come in there, I would have immediately recognized him. Also, I never met a Beverly Nelson during the many times I visited the restaurant and I cannot say she ever worked there. Roy Moore absolutely denies that he ever saw or signed any yearbook. 
and a few days ago gave Gloria Allred and Beverly Nelson a full 48 hours to turn in the yearbook over to forensic handwriting and forgery experts for examination. And guess what? They wouldn't turn it over. They didn't want experts examining that yearbook. Why? Well, you know why, don't you? I guess Gloria Allred, the now sagging 75-year-old murder-by-abortion queen of America, now on her last lap, wants less to be remembered as the attorney of Roe v. Wade, the 1973 Allred case that went on to kill millions of unborn children, than to be remembered as the low-down charlatan's lawyer who got herself whipped by the truth while her seedy client waved a phony Roy Moore yearbook inscription to try to destroy an innocent man. In the end, the hideous career of the all but inhumane publicity scumster Gloria Allred may end in Alabama, in scandalous disgrace, dog paddling in her own dirty oil pool defending a petty forger who was trying to persecute an innocent man. Allred wasn't slick enough or smart enough to have avoided her client's pathetic forgery scam, even if Allred didn't help perpetrate it. So who helped? Was it some British forger at CNN or the Washington Post that helped concoct this yearbook job? Someone planned it and someone perpetrated it, and someone most likely aided and abetted the forgery. Forensic ink date test can easily and conclusively show and date when two different inks were put on paper. Whoever the DA in Gatson, Alabama is right now ought to subpoena the yearbook as evidence this day assign a forensic documents examiner, and call a grand jury which can soon be investigating this and phony complainants, including the Washington Post and its reporters, for evidence, perjury, forgery, extortion, and conspiracy. This has become a national story of thugs, thieves, and swindlers, and their lawyers, invading Alabama from New York and Washington to steal votes by fraud and fake journalism. And this merits an investigation and action by the District Attorney of Etowah County, by the U.S. Attorney in Northern Alabama, by grand juries and by the state bars of Alabama and California. Roy Moore's accuser, Beverly Young Nelson's stepson, called her a liar and said what she was doing wasn't right. He supports Moore entirely. That I found out that my stepmother was one of the ladies that is accusing Judge Moore of an act that supposedly happened when she was a teenager. My father's name is John Allen Nelson. The woman that's committed this act against you, as against Mr. Moore, is Beverly Young Nelson. I've known the woman. She married my father many, many years ago. I've known her for a while now. And I truly do not believe that she's being honest about this. You're a good man, and I believe that you're what Alabama needs to move forward. I stand behind you 100%. And to my stepmother, I have a few questions on this. Why did you wait so long if this did happen? You said you were a teenager when it happened. But here it is now. How many years later? And all of a sudden, now you're going to bring it up when he's fixing to go. We done voted him into the house and trying, and trying to get him took out. I'm not going to have it. Judge Moore, we voted him in. He deserves to be where we want him to be. We the people made the decision. It's over. Democrats are taking a shot at him, using any and everybody they can get to take and tarnish his record, to get him out, or they could put a Democrat in place. Well, I'm sorry. We're not going to have that. And so for whatever reason she's done what she's done, this needs to end now. Judge Moore, you have my full support, and I back you 100%, and I do believe that you're innocent of all charges that the, she's trying to say and all these other people are trying to say. I believe they're just bought out people that sold themselves for money, and they're trying to do whatever they can to make you look bad. But in the end, it's not going to work. You're a good man, and I know you are, but I'm not going to let her get away with this one. Or manipulating the lies and bullshit. It's done. Today, that's done. My dad, his name is John Nelson. John and Ellen Nelson. He married her. And they've been married for many years now. This is the first time I ever heard about this rape or sexual molested thing. So this kind of gets 
kind of looks kind of screwed because I've been, she's been in the family for a while and I, she ain't never mentioned this before until this election shit. She's wrong as hell. And I believe you when you say you don't know who she is. I believe that. Like I said, I believe it was just more of a, a thing to get you out of office. I think this is a Democrat trip or this is a money. She's there for one or the other. And she's always tried to live pretty high on the hog, so I pretty much have to guess somebody paid her to get it done. The next morning, the Washington Post faced total humiliation and had another problem. Pastor Al Moore of Criola, Alabama, received a robocall identifying itself as the Washington Post. They were looking for women between the ages of 54 to 57 years who were willing to make damaging remarks about candidate Roy Moore and offering to pay up to $7,000 cash for damaging information. They left a code name for the callbacks to the Washington Post. The story is disintegrating further each day, but the harm to Roy Moore's reputation by the Washington Post fabricating its big lie leaves a permanent scar on Moore and his family. And its untruth is no balm and no justice. And now comes the final turn of the newspaper fraud knife, the big media pylon. When big Eastern newspapers and broadcasting corporations stick together, fake media begin quoting each other's lies, as though what another liar newspaper said somehow is evidence of the truth. How can they all be wrong? Well, the answer is clear. They're all wrong because they're all owned and controlled from New York and all pursuing a similar liberal agenda. Look at these three identical editorials in three different Alabama papers published yesterday. They instruct Alabama voters not to vote for Roy Moore and make him look guilty without trial or evidence. But wait, when was the last time you saw an editorial printed on page one? Or printed on newspaper masthead? That's right, you can't remember seeing that. Editorials are printed on the inside pages. But now look at these three. Three Alabama newspapers have written the identical editorial, all placing editorials on the top of the page where you've never seen them before. What a coincidence. You see, the liberals and their newspapers are dead set on keeping Roy Moore out of the Senate. The entire Washington and New York liberal agenda depends on President Trump lacking just a few votes in the Senate to achieve the Make America Great Again agenda. And Alabama sure as hell doesn't want to let fake newspapers put a screaming liberal, anti-gun abortionist Democrat like Doug Jones in the Senate and cast the deciding vote on President Trump's agenda. But the newspapers, in high moral dudgeon, pretend it's a moral issue and that they are the arbiters of morality. I'll tell you the moral issue. It's letting the fake media accuse an innocent man and destroying him in order to put their liberal candidate into the Senate. Ask yourself, just who owns these supposedly Alabama papers? Surprise, it's Advance Publication, owner of all three. Advance runs Alabama politics from New York by owning three Alabama newspapers. Advance isn't located in Alabama and never was. Advance is located on Staten Island in New York City and always was but they try to hide this truth from you and from other Alabama voters by putting a shell corporation with an Alabama name between their real New York home and their fake Alabama home. Like most liberal newspapers, the reporters were over 90% Hillary voters and are over 94% liberal biased. Newspapers pretending to be Alabamans only allow New York City liberals to tell Alabamas how to vote. Remember? All three papers opposed President Trump, all three opposed guns, and approve abortion right up to the instant of birth. Just like their pet candidate, Doug Jones. Nasty New York liberals pushing their nasty little agendas, invading Alabama, taking Alabama money, and fighting Alabama values tooth and nail. The good news is that these fake Alabama news rags are failing and dwindling down to three printings a week ending with fewer subscriptions than throwaway nickel traders. You can help traditional values succeed by helping these New York corporations disguised with Alabama names fail. 
Cancel your subscription today. Don't advertise with them. Tell your friends not to advertise with them and don't patronize businesses that do. Don't read their lies and never believe their fake media and their liberal values. That is why we have courts and not newspapers to sort out the truth. Why we have trial by jury and not trial by newspaper reporter. And all of this is why the public no longer believes fake news or fake media. Why newspapers are in full fail mode and why the nation's libel laws need reform. Roy Moore has said that he intends to sue the Washington Post and its reporters. We can all hope he does. Newspaper bullies like the Washington Post need to be sued often, and likewise the liars they reward. Ironically, New York Times v. Sullivan, the case the media bullies hide behind, is a case which originated in Alabama in 1964. And legal scholars are calling for a revisit by a Supreme Court that may soon be more conservative and may do exactly that. Many innocent people, their children, their businesses, their lives, have suffered irreparable reputation damage at the hands of small media bullies on the internet. Each of us can feel, in our own way, sympathy for what Judge Moore and his family have been put through at the hands of malicious liars and newspaper bullies like Jeff Bezos, who owns an out-of-control liberal newspaper. Imagine living in a country where you and every person are considered guilty until proven innocent, where anyone can say anything about you, can get you and your family arrested or ruin your lives or reputations, all without proof or real evidence just by accusing you, in a country where no evidence is required to convict you or destroy you. Want to live in a country like that? You do. Welcome to Washington Post world. If the Washington Post has its way with Roy Moore in Alabama, then liberals win any election by liberal media lying and fake news media returns to control politics in America with propaganda, with fake news like the floozy attacks until conservative America ends or until America itself is finished. Welcome to fake media world and the fakest newspaper America has ever printed, the Washington Post where Pulp Fiction writers scribble gossip and invent lies and churn out scuttlebutt night and day, pretending facts, inventing stories, embellishing malice, all with one point, to destroy conservatism and its icons forever. Some 94% of reporters are said to be left-leaning Democrats or committed liberals. The Washington Post is to truth what Antifa is to statues. Any lie will do if it harms a conservative. The new motto suggested is right. Democracy dies in the darkness of lies told by the Washington Post. What I'm doing right now is writing a check in support of Roy Moore, a great American and a legendary patriot who stands up and fights no matter what. And I hope you do the same thing. Later today, I'll buy my final copy ever of the Washington Post. I will burn it ceremoniously on a trash pile just to watch the fires of hell consume it. I'm taking my film crew and my staff down to Alabama to cover this invasion of Alabama by Mitch McConnell and to campaign for Judge Moore and MAGA. Mitch McConnell cannot be allowed to pack the Senate with liberal Republicans. Mitch McConnell must go if President Trump and MAGA are to succeed. Republican rhino liberals are trying to steal your vote in Alabama and destroy the Make America Great Again vision and destroy Trump's presidency. They're down to Washington Post thuggery and the personal destruction of Judge Roy Moore, who represents all of us in the Make America Great Again effort. And we're not going to let that happen.